The uh, title of my teaching tonight is uh, What Does the Bible Say About Humility? And uh, as I did the other day, other Sunday morning when I was teaching this at Sunday school, uh, I'd like to start out on a, on a humorous note or a humorous anecdote. I looked up that was a proper word in English. And uh, it goes something like that. Once upon a time, there was a pastor that felt like his congregation needed a teaching uh, about humility. So he uh, had an election in the church, passed out little sheets of paper, and everybody was to write on this paper the name of the most humble person in the church. And, after the, and then they collected these, these ballots, and the deacons went off somewhere and counted, but after the service, then the pastor said, okay, deacons, who is it? Well, the deacons came forward. The, the most humble person in this church is Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so. It's an anecdote, you know. And uh, so they, two, uh, uh, two uh, deacons proceeded to walk this, this person up front, and they gave him, a little, gave him or her a little medal, pinned it on them, and then they had this dismissal prayer, and they left the church. Well, next Sunday, when this person came in, all dressed up, had the pin on their chest, and uh, was walking down the aisle, the two deacons uh, got up and, and uh, took the pin away from them. So just what, <laughs> what number? <laughs> so that's, that's the story that I was trying to tell, but, but <laughs> somehow, somehow <laughs> our folks got, got a little bit different slant on it. Okay. Back so much for the humorous to, to loosen me up. Uh, first of all, we, I always go into a, a, a study. When I do a study for one of these lessons, I want to define things because my native language is not English, so I have to look up definitions still after all these years, probably more so now. But the first thing I wanted to mention is about humility is that uh, in Micah 6, 8, it says, and it continues, there's, there's a short uh, phrase in front of it up, but it says, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? And uh, that's what, is, what this lesson is based on. And then I go into the definition of humility. Uh, I pull a lot, a lot of these definitions off, off the web these days, and uh, it says in, a, in, the, uh, in one of the encyclopedias on the web, it says, humility is the defining characteristic of an unpretentious and modest person, someone who does not think he or she is better or more important than others. The term humility is derived from the Latin word humilis, which is translated not only as humble, but alternatively as low or from the earth, or and humus or humid. Now, in the, in the, in the antique past, they believed that uh, bodies of water, imbalances of bodies of water in your body Cause, cause problems with your emotions, diseases, depressions. Uh, that, that's, uh, so basically, uh, as I thought it was very interesting that they, they referred it back to, to humilis or to humus because we were made from that stuff. You know, God, God created us from that stuff, and so for us to be of humble nature, uh, we, need to we need to return back to earth 
and, and keep in mind where we really come from and where we're going to go in, unless the Lord comes first. Uh, another side of humility is biblically speaking, personal humility carries the notion of lowering or abasing oneself in such a manner as to attain a place of lowliness. The noted preacher Charles Spurgeon defined humility as making a right estimate of oneself. Another noted speaker stated, humility is not denying the power or gifting that you have, but admitting that the gifting is from God and the power comes through you and not from you. After World War II, Winston Churchill humbly commented that I was not the lion, but I felt it fell to me to give the lion's roar. And uh, so, well, humility is a uh, prominent Christian grace. To truly repent or put off pride also requires that we embrace humility. James 4.10 states, Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord and he'll exalt you. It's a great paradox in Christianity that humility is the avenue to glory. And I'm going to look at a, a couple of, uh, a number of examples of that. In, uh, and I'll, I'll read the scripture, but I, uh, I think the folks up, upstairs will project them up there too. So we can all follow that. It's a prominent Christian grace, humility. In Romans 12, 3, it says, For by grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Now that's, the Apostle Paul uh, bringing that to our, our attention. Another part of humility as a, a, gr a prominent grace is we should be led to humble, uh, we, we should be led to be humble by remembrance of our sins. And I, uh, I have that here too. Second. Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear them from heaven and I will forgive their sins and will heal their land. Uh, th that's uh, something all of us could use, but and especially the folks in this nation uh, could use and, uh, and uh, seek, the Lord, seek God's face, the Lord's face, and turn from the wicked ways, then we are promised that we will be f he will forgive our sins and heal uh, our land. Another way is a state of mind well-pleasing to God. Right? Uh, as Micah said, that we are to walk humbly with our God, and in that phrase, I wanted to bring out that it didn't say walk humbly before our God or walk humbly behind our God. It said walk humbly with your God. And that, uh, when I saw that, I said, wow, we to walk humbly. So the Lord is with us. He's not leading in front or pushing us from the rear. He's, he's on our side. And, and uh, we are to have great conversation with him in, in, in humbleness. Okay. Uh, Isaiah 66, 2 says, Has not my hand made all things, and so they came into being, declares the Lord. These are the ones I look on with favor, those who are humble and contrite in spirit, and who tremble at my word. So another, uh, another great aspect of this prominent grace, humility, is it, 
It preserves the soul in tranquility and peace. And so many of us need tranquility and peace, including myself. Matthew eleven twenty nine, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So the Lord sets the example. He tells us he's, he's uh, humble at heart and very gentle, and that can help but show us that, that his peace is what we desire and what we need. Uh, tranquil, uh, humility makes us patient under trials, Ephesians 4.2. Um, I have 30 references on, on humility from the Bible here, and that's not all, but that's what my computer spit out uh, after I put the word humility in there. So, uh, Chronicles. Ephesians 4, 2. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Thank you, saints. <laughs> Bear with me in love. <laughs> okay. Humility, though, that's the, uh, the paradox in Christianity. Everywhere you see in the world, or almost 99%, I guess, or in the world, the paradox is uh, the people with the horsepower, the people with the strength, the people with the influence, the people with the money uh, get the glory or get the fame, the fortune, and uh, the rule. Uh, however, in Christianity, it's just the opposite. The, uh, the humility is the avenue of, to glory. So I want to read Luke 14, 11. And for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And uh, that, that is a, a great promise that we have if we are humble. The, the greatest promises that, that are made to us as the Lord's saints uh, is when we are humble. He blesses us the most. Matthew 18, 4. I wanted to read that. Therefore, whoever takes a humble place, becoming like a child, is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And uh, that's uh, made me think of what about those children that, that die first? You know, normally the children bury the parents. But those children, they're, they're going to be with the Lord right away. And it says they, they, they are the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So I don't know if they get a front row on the, on, on the choir or what it is, but the Lord said it, that we, we are to become like a child and uh, uh, be humble like a child. Now, I wanted to get more into the examples, and I have listed uh, three folks from the, the Old Testament and three from the New, and then some personal things, personal experiences. I started out with Abraham. Uh, of course, where was Abraham humble? Well, he was willing to sacrifice his only son, his only, uh, shall I say, legal son, because Ishmael was, yeah. Anyhow, he took his, his son when God told him, he humbled himself, took him, put some uh, firewood on, on his back and climbed up on top of a mountain, Mount Moriah, and tied him up, and he had his, his knife up, and he was ready to kill him. Now, that's described in Genesis 22, 1. And uh, 
when you think about that is, he was willing to do it, but God did it. God uh, sacrificed his son, his only son. Uh, but he prevented Abraham from doing it. It's the, the glory and the humility of it was to go to his son. Moses, in, in Numbers 12, 3, it says, um, I believe it says, Moses was the most humble person on the face of the earth. Now that's quite a, a thought to be the how you know that to be the most humble person on the face of the earth at that time or maybe forever. I Lord I'll have to clarify that. But he was very, very humble, yet he's uh, uh, one of the greatest prophets and leaders the Hebrews had, ever had. Then I want to bring out the uh, again the example of Mephibosheth. He was a son of jo Jonathan's, and he was born crippled and with, uh, was handicapped. And in 2 Samuel 9, 8, after King David asked for whether there were any descendants of Saul still alive, and he was told Mephibosheth was still alive, and uh, he was living with a fairly well-to-do family. Then Mephibosheth uh, he called him, Mephibosheth came, and he said, Lord, what uh, do you want from your servant, this old dog? You know, he, he basically uh, s called himself an old dog, that he, he wasn't able to, to bring anything to the table. Well, David brought him to the table, and in that sense, we are also brought to the table. So that, that's, uh, so if we humble ourselves, uh, we will be the greatest in the kingdom. In the New Testament, I will just paraphrase uh, John the Baptist uh, example is that he, he was an up and coming evangelist, preacher, reformer, and people were following him by the thousands. And then somebody, some of his disciples told, told him, hey, there's another fellow around named Jesus, and people are starting to leave you and follow that guy. And John the Baptist showed his humility, his true humility. He said, I'm not even worthy to tie Jesus' sh uh, shoelaces or shoes, sandals. So uh, he was a very humble man. Paul didn't start out humble, but he became so humble that uh, it, it later on in his life he says, I was the worst of sinners. I, and and uh, that was a very humbling uh, position to take. Jesus, of course, is the ultimate example of humbling yourself. Uh, I look at, at God, at, at, at the Holy Spirit, at Jesus, like uh, something I can understand. is like he looks upon us as the ants on the ground, <coughs> busy, running around. And the Lord, uh, God says, go down there and let those ants kill you. And Jesus obeyed. He humbled himself and he came down here to be, a, be among us in human form. And you know the rest of the story, he died on the horrible Roman cross. So that's the ultimate example of humility. You are letting <coughs> what you've created kill you for their benefit. Um, okay, now I wanted to go on, which I did also in my, my uh, teaching day in Sunday school at I like to always show that uh, what, what is some of the biggest things that, that I, myself, where I uh, came under or humbled myself. And this, this one is not so easy even for me because uh, I was uh, uh, a member of a large denomination 
I was comfortable, I uh, had a position, and I was, I was in my comfort zone. I decided they already who was going to pre preach my funeral 100 years from now, and, and I was set. Well, along comes my uh, wife, who's passed on to be with the Lord, and says, I've been going to this little church over there, uh, called the Shield of Faith on Wednesday nights when you were watching TV. And uh, I'm convinced that the Lord has asked me to go to church over there. And of course, <laughs> you know, uh, I am, you know, I am the, the priest and I am the the leader of this clan here, and I determined where this, this went against everything that I thought uh, my upbringing in a European country taught me. And uh, I wrestled with that one a, a few days. Not, not that long, but the Lord showed me that uh, maybe I need to come under because I was convinced even before that, that the family that prays together stays together. And that not only means praying in, in private, but also uh, uh, praying at church with the saints because your, your prayers are magnified when all the, the Holy Spirits come of the people, the church, come together and lift the prayers up to the Lord. So I came on the, as one, one of the, uh, it meant a lot to me, to other people might not, but it was, it was tough for me to do that. Uh, then I said, well, what I'm going to talk about here about when I say about others that I've observed, and right away, Pastor Bob jumped out. He's one of the most humble men that I have met among uh, theologians and, and, and the number, of, I think I'm up to church number 10 since I started going to church at about four years old. So I went back and listed all the churches that have blessed me and again the people in those churches that have blessed me. And I just give my vote for Pastor Bob as being, and Su Miss Susan as being some of the most humble people I've ever met. And uh, no, n we, no, we're not going to give you a medal. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a few more minutes, so I wanted to get started with the second part of this lesson, which is on the back. And uh, 12 ways to humble yourselves. I got this on my... Uh, out of, from a fellow named Alfred Els, MC. I don't even know what MC stands, maybe Master of Confessions or something. <laughs> but uh, uh, he lists 12 things that we, uh, we should, uh, ex uh, and I look at this sort of as a self-examination. Um, Give yourself a grade of, when you get some time one day, to give yourself a grade of 1 to 10 on each one of these 12 points and see how you come out. And maybe this, this is called introspection. And uh, maybe you, uh, uh, but let's, let's go into, uh, it says, routinely confess your sin to God. All of us sin fall short of the glory of God, however, too few of us have a routine practice of rigorous self-honesty of examination, weekly, even daily, review of your heart and behavior coupled with confession to God is an essential humility. And for that I wanted to read uh, quickly uh, Luke 18, 9 to 14. This is an example of the, the, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And starts in verse 9. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. 
one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and said about himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. And then starting at verse 13, but the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus told them, I tell you that this man rather than the other went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So even Jesus taught us that, that we need to confess our sins to God. Immediately, and we're being taught here, immediately after your, the Holy Spirit brings it to your attention that you, that you have sinned or transgressed or falling a, fallen a little short, that you are to confess that and repent. And how many times? Seven times 70, <laughs> if it takes it. The second uh, way to uh, examine ourselves is to acknowledge your sin to others. Humility before God is not complete unless there is also humility before man. A true test of our willingness to humble ourselves is being willing to share with others the weaknesses we confess to God. Wisdom, however, dictates that we should do so with others that we trust. And that, that one, uh, uh, I pretty well was able to handle that one with my spouse, but uh, since she's passed on to be with the Lord, uh, I, everyone should develop a prayer partner or a confessor. Pastor Bob mentions that there is a gentleman that uh, he comes under to under the ministry for correction if necessary. James says in, f in uh, chapter 5, verse 16, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. It's, it's, a, 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 it's a little harder for a person to confess their, their sins and transgression. Well, first you have to confess them to the Lord, obviously, but also confess them to your prayer partner or confessor because... Uh, Apparently, it's good for us because James says so. And uh, in, in other churches, they actually have confession. <laughs> Whereas we are not very uh, confessional that way, uh, leaning, most of us. I need, I need help in that area. Uh, we need to humble ourselves to take wrong patiently. Uh, this has been a difficult one for me. When something is unjust, I want to react and rectify it. However, patiently responding to the unjust accusation and actions of others demonstrates our strength of godly character and provides an opportunity to put on humility. Whew, that's a mouthful. But let's read the... Uh, let's... Uh, that's First Peter three, eighteen through seventeen, and I I'm going to just hold that to First uh, Peter three eight and nine. Suffering for doing good. Finally, all of you, live in harmony with e one another. Be sympathetic, love as brothers, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. 
In other words, if, if the guy that's kicked us in the chin and we bless him and, and uh, pray for his salvation, that, that, uh, then we are sure to inherit a blessing from the Lord, especially if it's in his name's sake. And then uh, the fourth point I have here is act, actively submit to authority, the good and the bad. Uh, our culture does not value submission. Rather, it promotes individualism. How purposely and actively do you work in submission to those whom God has placed as authorities in your life? Doing so is a good way to humble yourself. Uh, I want to read uh, 1 Peter uh, two, ver chapter 2, verse 18. Slaves, submit yourself to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. That one is, is uh, not highly thought of in our society, but... Uh, we all could use some help in that area. Uh, let's see. And here's the fifth point. Receive correction and feedback from others graciously. Uh, the, in the Phoenix area, a local East Valley pastor was noted for graciously receiving any negative feedback or correction offered. He would simply say, Thank you for caring enough to share that with me. I will pray about it and get back to you. Look for a kernel of truth in what people offer you, offer you, even if it comes from a dubious source. Always pray, Lord, what are you trying to show me through this? And uh, I'm sure Pastor Bob can identify with this one. Uh, I wanted to read a, a couple of Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs 10, 17. He who heeds discipline shows the way to life, but wh whoever ignores correction leads others astray. That one is, and the, the other one was uh, Proverbs 12, 1. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. I guess I've been stupid a few times in my life. <laughs> okay, moving right along. Accept the lowly place. Another uh, grace that's not too much of our culture, to accept the low, lowly place. Proverbs 25, 6, and seven, six, do not exalt yourself in the king's presence and do not claim a place among the great men. It is better for him to say to you, come up here, than for him to humiliate you before a nobleman. So uh, if you ever found yourself wanting to sit at the head table, wanting, wanting other people to recognize you, for your contribution, or become offended when others are honored or chosen, then pride is present. Sometimes I've been affected by that a little bit, but uh, we should always propose to support others being recognized rather than you. Accept and look for the lowly place. It is the place of humility. Pastor Bob it, it, as in his teaching, he's told us the story of him being passed over, f over for supervisor at the air base where he worked for so many years. And, and th that his response was that he went to the man that was selected, quote, over him and said, I'll be the best employee you have and I'll back you 100% of the time. So that uh, he's setting us a wonderful example in that, in that teaching. And number seven, purposely associate with people of lower state than you. 
Jesus deri was derided by the Pharisee for socializing with the poor and those of lowly uh, state. Our culture is very status conscious and people naturally want to socialize upward. Resist the temptation of being partial to those with status or wealth. And for that I wanted to read Luke 7 and uh, 36 to 38. Jesus anointed by a sinful woman. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. That's the way they dined in those days. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating a, at a Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume and she stood behind him at his feet, weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. And needless to say, the Pharisees probably didn't think very well of that. Uh, but uh, uh, she, she was anointing Christ for his burial. And uh, he told them that she had done a beautiful thing for him. Number eight, choose to serve others. When we serve others, we are serving God's purposes in their lives. Doing so reduces our focus on ourselves and builds the kingdom of God instead of the kingdom of self. When serving others costs us nothing, we should question whether, whether or not it is really servanthood. And uh, I need that, and I... I accept that, Lord. And I wanted to read uh, Matthew 23, 11. Matthew 23. The greatest among you will be your servant. Very short verse, but uh, I, uh, I accept it. I come on. To be quick to forgive. Forgiveness is possible only, possibly one of the greatest acts of humility we can do. To forgive is to acknowledge a wrong that has been done us and also to further release our right of repayment for the wrong. Forgiveness is self, is denial of self. Co forgiveness is not insisting on our way and our justice. And Matthew 18, 21, and 22 is what I want to read. Uh, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 70, 70 times seven times. Time. In other words, always. Forgive someone uh, that comes to us and, and asks for forgiveness. Be quick to forgive. Cultivate a grateful heart. The more we develop an attitude of gratitude for the gift of salvation and the life he has given us, the truer is our perspective of self. A grateful heart is a humble heart. You might have noticed that I've learned to pray, to be thankful for every day the Lord lets me get out of bed and put my feet on the floor and walk away from that bed. I've learned through my wife's illnesses and my illnesses and, and the other folks at, at the nursing homes that that it that is a really real blessing to be to be thankful for because there are many people who would just love to get up on their feet and come here tonight and pray and be with the saints. So that's always in my prayer for a while. 
has been for a while. Proposed to speak well of others, and that has to do with edifying. So let me read uh, Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Saying negative things about others puts, puts them one down. I wonder they, if they ever thought of this, some of our Christian politicians, <laughs> when they run for election. Uh, you know, speaking negative about others and, and uh, to go on and us one up a form of pride. Speaking well of others edifies them and builds them up instead of us. Make sure, however, that what you say is not intended as flattery. Okay. Pastor Bob has taught many times on this and his saying is, be an edified edifier, if I remember correctly. So I have one more item, and then we'll uh, close this teaching out. Number 12, treat pride as a condition that always necessitates embracing the cross. Is our nature to be proud, and it is God's nature in us that brings humility committing to a lifestyle of daily dying to self and living through him is the foundation for true humility. In uh, Luke 9.23 it says, Then he said to them all, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And... Uh, so we are, we are commanded, and we should follow the Lord. Well, that's that's it for the night for me, folks. Thank you so much for your attention. Praise the Lord. Do we have any humble people in the house? <laughs>